my kind of music. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about the uh, resurgence of uh, social media platforms. I advocate for bringing back MySpace um, or bulletin boards, actually. Um, no hashtags on bulletin boards. Uh, but yeah, please bring back bulletin boards. Uh, you know, if Reddit dies, then bulletin boards are the way to go. Uh, I really hope they come back. Um, it's really fantastic to be on stage today uh, and a massive privilege to be speaking on home turf. Um, and I hope everyone has a really fantastic conference. The agenda looks really, really cool. Um, I want to talk today about running large scale migrations continuously. Uh, there is an easy way out if you don't want to, if you want to tune out for the next 20 minutes, which is don't run them at all. Uh, just stay on your current tech stack. Don't do anything. Don't change anything. You'll have less incidents. Things will go wrong less often. Everything will be a hunky-dory, and uh, you can sleep well at night, knowing that nothing is shifting beneath your feet. But if you do want to run migrations, then hopefully this talk will be useful. Um, I think many people here have experienced uh, the dread uh, when you realize that a core piece of your software has you know, sort of become out of date or an open source framework that was maintained by another company uh, has now sort of disappeared uh, and is no longer fit for purpose. And, you know... There's, there's a library that's been sunset or a language that's become like out of support. Uh, we've all been in this pit of regret, um, and it's where we keep the skeletons. Uh, and sometimes you get advanced warning. Uh, you know, if a company is really good about it, they'll be like, okay, well, we're not having the, the engineering power to, to continue to support this library. But a lot of times it just sort of disappears beneath your feet. Um, and I'm going to start with the disappointing news, which is this talk is not going to solve for that. So if that's what you're expecting, then I'm really, really sorry. Uh, but I don't think there is a solution for that. Uh, but hopefully there are some good techniques to help you migrate to the new, new and sexy. Um, and before we dive too deep, uh, a quick introduction. My name is Sahel. Um, I run the platform team at Monzo, which is literally around the corner, uh, which is uh, quite a nice commute for me. Uh, and I uh, lead the platform group uh, where we look after all of Monzo's infrastructure. So our philosophy at Monzo is to have engineers write software that powers the bank and not have to worry about things like databases and queues and, you know, whether the system is going to be running tomorrow or overnight. Um, and, yeah, we take care of all of it. Uh, under a shared responsibility model, you can't just fling your software over the fence and expect that that it runs. Uh, there is a shared responsibility. You're responsible for the code that you write, and we're responsible for making sure that it runs safely and securely and continues to stay up and running for all of our customers. Um, if you remember the magic of Heroku, if you folks have used Heroku before, that's the magic that we try to emulate, but one that is suitable for the banking world uh, in an opinionated manner uh, and working in a regulated environment, which mostly means that I get to deal with the regulators and engineers get to ship software, uh, and I'm very jealous uh, as as a result. Uh, for those who haven't uh, heard of Monzo before, uh, we are an online-only bank. All of our branches are on GitHub. Um, I think I should probably retire that joke. Um, but yeah, all of our branches are on GitHub. It's actually quite nice. So we have an API we're mandated to have uh, called Stash Branches, and it's the easiest API that we've had to write because it's just an empty array, um, all, of our, all of our branches, uh, which is really quite nice. Um, but yeah, we provide an app for money management. Uh, we are a fully licensed and regulated bank. Uh, we have over 7 million customers in the, in the UK and growing. Um, and you know, we, uh, we, prov we provide all sorts of banking functionality. We are fully, f fully retail bank. Uh, so go check it out if you haven't already. Now, um, I must caveat this. If there are any people working at TSB here or worked on Proteo for UK, I'm really sorry because I'm going to be dunking on you for one slide. But it's okay because um, I'll show you some of my failures in the next slide um, or, or, the, or the subsequent slides. Um, so uh, TSB, for those who aren't familiar, is a high street bank here in the UK. Um, and they were working on a migration project uh, when they separated from Lloyd's um, a couple years back. And they were going to move themselves onto a completely new banking platform. Uh, the migration, unfortunately, didn't go quite as smooth as they anticipated. And a lot of customers were left without access uh, to, to their money for multiple weeks. And the fallout uh, result, uh, resulted for, for multiple months. Um, TSB, at the end, uh, res uh, had a £30 million pound fine uh, on top of the £33 million pound that they had to provide to customers uh, in, in compensation. And the uh, untold cost of reputational damage uh, as well. And the report itself is a really fascinating read. Uh, you can find it on fca.org.uk. 
Um, and the report focuses on the technological aspect. So, you know, things that went wrong and, you know, the fact that they were doing a waterfall design and, the, you know, the timelines went all out of date. And there were a lot of, like, technical things, like things not being tested and QA falling behind in terms of software development. But a significant part of the report talks about uh, organizational failings, you know, failings in terms of project management, in terms of planning processes, things not keeping up in, uh, in, in the way that they were running the program. Um, and many of us, uh, like, you know, we, we can all sit here, you know, maybe we work at startups and we're like, that could never happen to us. Uh, but I promise you, no matter how agile your startup is, uh, you know, there are a lot of learnings in the report where you will probably read and you'll be like, actually, I have seen cracks like that at my company, whether you work in a two person startup or a multi thousand person organization. Um, and you know, it, it takes a little bit of heart to reflect on some of these organizational aspects when it, when these things come to the come to the foray. We often run these really large migration projects as snowflakes. You know, it's sort of like a one and done operation. We spin up a completely new team, uh, and you know they go and tackle these things, and then they inevitably overrun and go over budget and you know then we add more people to the mix and you know it all becomes a, a massive disaster and then it's all hands on deck and then the thing ships and we all celebrate uh, but we don't often build a culture where we're running these projects continuously now uh, let me relate that back to a problem that we have at monzo our development stack um, and, our, and our deployment and, and production stack is relatively modern you see a lot of technologies there that are still like you know very much supported and very much uh, at, at the foray in the in the industry so we spent a lot of innovation tokens betting on technologies like go and kubernetes and microservices and and all of these other aspects as part of our foundations and these foundational bets have massively paid off uh, we have built over 2500 micro services, which is a lot, uh, and maybe I can talk in office hours in, in how, we, how we manage all of that, and we deploy over 100 times a day. So all of that is, is fine and dandy. But things are very different from the early days. Uh, you know, we are a much larger player in the industry. I think we are uh, number seven in the like, UK, UK bank list, uh, and there are, there are a lot more customers that depend on us. So we can't just go and, like, you know, take the Kubernetes cluster down for like a minute. Uh, we can't suffer downtime. It's not part of our architectural and engineering principles, but it's also something that we aren't able to do. We can't just take production down and, you know, hope for the best. Uh, you know, we can't lose our monitoring system, for example, even though there would be little customer impact unless something went horribly wrong. Uh, you know, we can't just take it down and, and hope for the best. Now, we're not only building and deploying, like, you know, when I say we deploy it hundreds of times a day, we're not only building systems and services in the periphery of the critical path. Uh, for example, here's all the services that get involved when you tap your Monzo card in a store. Um, and many of these things are things like checking your account, you know, recording uh, the transaction into a ledger, running financial crimes. All of these things are critical flows. And we have a very small window of time to approve or decline these, these payment uh, instructions. Otherwise, you'd be waiting at prep forever. Um, or Farmer J, uh, depending on your choice of, of lunch. Um, strong recommend for Farmer J. Um, you know, we want to provide a really delightful experience and we want to make it as quick as possible. And engineers are, are deploying changes to these critical services like our ledger multiple times a day. Uh, and we've got to make sure that all of that continues to work. And, uh, you know, from an infrastructural and cost management point of view, we can't provide individualized environments for all of these different services. Imagine we had to run 2,500 Kubernetes clusters or databases uh, or, or queuing systems. Uh, all of that would be an absolute nightmare to manage uh, and would be massively cost inefficient. So instead, we run these components uh, as like, uh, with multiple tenants on, on a singular cluster. However, many of these components are running on, for example, older versions or like, you know, versions with, with, uh, with issues and things that we want to fix. And they continue to work uh, and they are known quantities, but they're things that we want to keep up to date within industry. We don't want to fall too far behind. Um, but typically, you know, when you have small teams, you prioritize product level problems. You prioritize things that customers want to be able to see. You know, customers really don't shout about when you, when you are reliable. 
when we've needed to poke these things, though, uh, there has been a pit of despair. This is, this is my failure. Uh, like, I took down production. Has anyone taken down production before? Uh, yes, a lot of hands. Very good. Very good. So hopefully this is a room of sympathy. Uh, nobody's going to lob tomatoes at me. Um, I did take down production. I broke the database. Um, so we had, uh, in, in July 2019, uh, a very vivid day uh, where I broke uh, the Cassandra ring, and uh, that meant all of our data ended up in the wrong place, and it was a massive disaster. We did recover it in the end. Um, but one of the big learnings from this particular incident is how unfamiliar we were with uh, configuration and scaling of this critical piece of software because all of the expertise that, that uh, you know, had originally configured this and set this up were working on other things and you know, hadn't had the time to document and, and write down all the steps that they had taken. So we needed to find a way out of the rut. Now, typically, when these sorts of projects are first identified, the natural inclination is to, you know, think about whether this is the most valuable thing, right? Uh, you know, are we working on the most impactful thing? It's a question, it's an existential crisis that we ask ourselves very routinely. And I think this is a false economy. Uh, it makes us reluctant to start these projects in the first place uh, because, you know, we very rarely have the question, uh, we very, very rarely have the answers to, uh, you know, answer the question of whether this is the most impactful thing. Uh, you know, can we pull it off? Uh, do we have the right team structure? Uh, and, you know, there, uh, if we need to do all of this convincing up front, there is an expectation that uh, we are going to be, uh, we're going to deliver. Uh, and I wouldn't want to hedge my bets on a project where I didn't think I would be able to deliver to 100%. Now, one approach I found really, really effective is to be very upfront about the time to experiment. Uh, almost to the point where, you know, we are being somewhat forceful and saying, I am going to spend a block of time and I'm going to experiment. And as staff engineers and leaders, this is a position of privilege uh, that we, I don't think we utilize as, as often. Uh, we have our, the ability to say that we're going to divert time from some other priorities uh, to work on something tangential. Uh, and that use of sway doesn't need to be selfish either because we can bring others along for the ride. Uh, typically, you know, when we're speaking to directors and other stakeholders, they are looking for input and opinions of where others can, can excel and we can bring these projects to the foray and we can bring others along for the ride. We can give the opportunity and open doors for others to take the reins, uh, you know, for uh, what might be a pebble for us could be a rock for someone else. Um, and similar to like, you know, many branches in, in a tree, there might be many different paths that you explore, uh, and there's many ways to skin a cat. There's many ways to approach a particular problem. And ultimately, with a fixed amount of time, there's only a subset that we can go down. So being able to guide and nurture other engineers about how, what approaches we've taken and what approaches we're, we're gonna, we're gonna go, we should be going down uh, is a really good way to be spending our time and deliver impact. <laughs> Now, many times the telemetry or the hypothesis, uh, so the telemetry that we need to prove our hypothesis isn't quite there. Um, and often what I see is that a lot of, a lot of engineers want to have all of the data up front. Uh, they want to have 100% conviction uh, in, in the approach that they're going to, going to be able to take, which means we spend a significant amount of time up front uh, debating, for example, like architectural decision records. We burn a lot of political capital. Uh, a lot of time isn't spent up front delivering on experimental code. And, uh, you know, one of the best techniques that I found to be able to run these migrations at scale is to, uh, you know, just deliver some stuff in some sort of shadow mode if you have that ability uh, and get it shipped. And you can do this even in client applications as well. Like, you know, it's something that I hear is like, oh, we can't run code in the background, but our, uh, you know, our systems are really, really powerful. They can do multiple things. Uh, and you can run some stuff in the background to prove your hypothesis in a very short amount of time. And you can do this in a non-disruptive manner. I think this is the thing that we should be excelling at as staff and principal engineers is to be able to do this in a non-disruptive manner. Uh, we shouldn't ask other engineers to change their workflow in order for you to experiment, but we can navigate that political and organizational landscape to be able to ship this in, in, in a background manner. And you know, with the ability to flick it on and off with a switch uh, is a very powerful ability. And remember, there's, there's always going to be a few false starts uh, before you get to the right solution. So you've got some telemetry, uh, thanks to the experimentation that you've done. Uh, the stakeholder dance comes next. And, uh, you know, many of, many of the times, you know, you need uh, the support of other people in order, in order to execute. 
Um, we, for example, do an architectural review process across the company where we have, you know, a proposal being written and, you know, uh, engineers have the ability to provide feedback. Um, and, you know, previously this used to be sort of like a gatekeeping, a barrier process. You know, are we building the right thing? Uh, you know, is this the right way to approach this? Uh, you know, almost like a, like a barrier to entry. And we had to rectify this quite quickly. Uh, you know, we had to sort of invert the method. Uh, and effectively, an architecture review is to bring the support and uh, bring understanding, a shared understanding to all your fellow engineers. Uh, you know, we are in a, a you know, a fairly advanced position as staff and principal engineers where we have a lot of context and knowledge and autonomy of our particular area of expertise. So you are the domain expert. Uh, you know, an architecture review isn't a gatekeeping process because you're not going to get a significant amount of challenge if you are the domain expert within your, your particular field. Uh, you know, you're not looking for the, the universal best solution. Instead, you want to bring others along for the ride. How can they support you? How can you build advocacy for your particular project? Uh, you know, are your credible solutions suitable enough uh, and you know have you have you understood all of the constraints uh, for us uh, when we run these architecture reviews uh, we have an agenda we have topic points agreed prior to the session so there's not any nasty surprises uh, and everyone is expected to, to have read the proposal beforehand um, and it's a really large time investment uh, from time to time but honestly it's a really fantastic way to gather feedback and advocacy and support from your fellow engineers. And we actually record these sessions for consumption across Monza because they're really good context building sessions. Uh, and we want to make sure that all of the discussion is captured. Now, there's going to be external buy-in as well. Uh, and, you know, we have a really, uh, we have a lot of leeway on how we spend our time as, as staff and principal engineers. So we should be the ones that are going to be advocating for change and improvements. And we often forget to use this capital in the best possible way. Uh, one of the things that I think we miss is not using our voice to like prioritize these projects and using uh, and like uh, being very explicit about the space and time that we need to make sure that our systems uh, continue to remain healthy. Now, feedback is a gift, uh, but sometimes it can also be an un unwelcome shock. Um, you know, especially when you get something that doesn't directly align with your particular vision or how you wanted to execute something. Um, a lot of engineers, uh, especially when you're giving feedback, I think this is, this is very, very important. Uh, being very explicit about blocking and non-blocking feedback. Um, you know, what is something that you think must be solved before this, this particular project can go ahead? Be very, very explicit about that versus commentary, uh, like, you know, stuff that is sidebar, stuff that is tangential, stuff that is just good to know. Uh, often we're not very explicit about these things. Now, uh, unfortunately, this talk is not going to go into how you, uh, they're going to actually write the code in an editor. Uh, that's really going to depend on your organization. But, you know, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that we spend a significant amount of time at the architecture review process or proposal writing process getting every single nitpicky detail right. Um, but, you know, uh, as I'm sure many people who've run migration projects, typically what you write in a proposal and what is delivered are two very uh, vastly different things. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of the decisions that you burnt your political capital on during the architecture review process uh, didn't need to materialize when you actually came to implementation. I've seen wildly different implementations when it actually comes to brass tacks. Um, so there are always going to be unknown scalability challenges and, and things like that. Um, and often what I've seen is that the actual implementation is, is really, really different. And it almost feels like you've pulled the wool over people's eyes. Uh, you know, we don't often keep our stakeholders up to date on how things are progressing. Um, so that's something that I really want us to advocate for in general. Now, when it actually comes to running these migrations, uh, there's two ways that uh, you can go about it. Uh, you can run it in a centralized manner where you have a central team doing it on behalf of, of all engineers. Uh, there's another way, which is you fan out uh, these migration projects to all of the different teams. And you say, okay, right, we've built a framework, we've built a structure, we've built some libraries and tooling uh, in order for you to run this migration. And you can run it of your, of your own volition. Uh, there are pros and cons to, to both approaches. I am a big advocate for running it as a centralized team, mostly then, uh, mostly because you know other teams have different priorities, and typically these projects are bottom of the run. Uh, you know, uh, especially when they are uh, like uh, background projects. Uh, you know, where they aren't, aren't delivering immediate customer value. Um, so, I am a big proponent of the centralized team model, where a team 
owns uh, the entire migration process end-to-end, -end, and you give that team the responsibility and empower them to, do, uh, to, to see this migration project through. Now, uh, a lot of the migration projects that we run uh, often require, uh, you know, changes to like a runtime configuration of, of a particular application uh, of all services or a subset of services that are running on our platform. And uh, one of our architectural principles is not to accept downtime. Uh, so we want to run these migrations in an online manner. Um, and, you know, uh, earlier on, I mentioned that we only have a fixed amount of time, for example, when you tap your card uh, to when we need to approve a decision. So we can't just take a system down even for a couple minutes uh, or suffer a couple minutes of latency because that would mean a poor decision for customers. Now, when we are running these migrations, we often, uh, you know, run these migrations as a one and done operation and that a lot of the context uh, on, on the steps to running a migration uh, isn't very explicitly documented. Uh, so a, an approach that has worked really, really well for us is to be very, very explicit, almost like a run bug. Imagine that you were running this at three in the morning, a step-by-step -step procedure that a human would need to do to run this migration by hand. Uh, and the exact commands, uh, you know, go into that level of detail uh, to see whether the correct change has been applied and things are not hor horribly broken. Uh, the goal is that if any engineer came along, uh, any competent engineer that is familiar with the stack but might not be familiar with the migration process, they are able to pick up this document and follow exactly what is going on and understand what stages their migration is at. Now, this might seem like uh, a lot of overkill, but it can really help identify risks uh, and it, point of no return is, is ultimately what I'm looking for. Um, and I personally prefer that these points of no return are at the end of migrations uh, because typically the risks materialize earlier in migrations. Uh, but, you know, documenting rollback steps, uh, you know, forcing people to think about rollback criteria is one of the core reasons why we write this document. Uh, and I think this is where we should be spending our time and energy and political capital, uh, you know, making sure that we minimize risks uh, and making sure that when it actually comes to brass tacks, when you're actually running this thing in production, things are going to go as smoothly as possible rather than spending all of our time up front where things have not even been built uh, and, you know, debating your choice of technology and scaling and things like that. Um, this process is really, really useful if you combine them with things like pre-mortems uh, and fire drills. You know, what can go wrong beforehand? Uh, you know, here's an opportunity for us to outline all of the risks uh, and communicate that to all of our stakeholders. Now, a pattern that we use internally uh, that works phenomenally well is automated coherence checking. Um, so, for example, uh, we have a lot of microservices, as I mentioned, uh, and what we do is we add a few more to the graph, uh, and these are services that are going to be our guinea pigs. So these are services that we run and we write. They're not handling any sort of production traffic, uh, and they are running a predictable workload uh, that's mimicking what we see in production. Um, and these are perfect candidates for us to sort of test the migration procedure. Uh, and this you know, it seems like additional work. You know, you've got to write additional code, you've got to spin up a service, you've got to get it deployed, you've got to mimic uh, what is happening in production. This is all additional work and overhead. But the amount of times that this has saved our bacon is uh, immeasurable uh, because we're able to continuously add new things that we find to these coherent services and constantly migrate them back and forth uh, between, between our migration procedure. This tests both our moving forward procedure and our rolling back procedure as well without the fear of getting it wrong. Now, uh, I've talked quite a bit about uh, all of our microservices, the color coordinated graph. This is a few years old. Um, and we do strive for software uniformity on our platform. We don't have 2,500 pieces of mess. At least I don't think so. Maybe uh, other, other monzonauts in the audience might, might disagree. Um, but, you know, we, we like to have common bits of infrastructure powering all of our microservices. So, you know, uh, all of our services, for example, use the same database technology or use Kafka as their, as their queuing backend. Um, and all of these run on top of our Kubernetes infrastructure. Um, so when we are running these migrations, many services need to be touched. Uh, and teams are constantly iterating on them. And we don't want to block these teams from uh, deploying their own changes while these migrations are running. 
Now, we have over 300 engineers in different parts of the organization, and that number really does continue to grow. Uh, if, for example, we're running uh, migrations in a centralized team manner, uh, you know, there's going to be dependencies and assumptions that we're making about software that we don't want engineers to shift beneath our, beneath our feet. Uh, so, for example, you know, if we're assuming that all engineers are using uh, you know, a particular technology like Kafka, then we can build our migration system to work with Kafka. They might not work with other systems like SQS or, 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 or some other queuing technology. Uh, and we need a way to uh, automatically, like, you know, block engineers if their system is about to be migrated uh, and uh, we're not prepared for them to use other bits of technology. Uh, my favorite strategy is to use static analysis. Uh, and if you've not used SEMGREP before, um, I strongly recommend you check it out. It allows, it's like, like REP but it is uh, programming language aware and allows you to write simple rules like, you know, uh, don't use these particular functions uh, or do use these particular functions. And uh, you can make uh, checks at CI time uh, that stop engineers at uh, CI time uh, from shipping code that you are not quite ready to support. Now, you can't run these migrations by hand, especially at, at our scale when you're migrating so many services because the opportunity to get it wrong is, is really high, especially when you have 2,500 of them. Um, and often what I see is uh, these migration processes are usually orchestrated by some crafty scripting. Uh, you know, someone will write some crafty Python script or, or, or something, maybe bash um, if you are, if you are uh, a little bit crazy. Um, you know, I, I, I see it happen all of the time, uh, and it's uh, you know typically that means that we don't take uh, full advantage of, of automation, and this automation is not reusable because these are usually one and done scripts. Uh, one of the best things uh, I think we've advocated for is to write a service that migrates other services. Uh, so very meta, um, but uh, we uh, we started this when we were going to start a project to migrate all of our databases from our own self-hosted Cassandra to uh, an, uh, a managed system called Amazon Key Spaces. Um, and this is a service uh, that we wrote that orchestrates all of the steps. So earlier on, I mentioned the document, uh, which uh, you know, uh, essentially is documenting a run book of how we run these migrations and all of its rollback procedures. This service is automation of that particular run book. So it goes as a, it's literally a, a linear state machine that goes from beginning to end uh, and effectively has all of the gatekeeping steps like, you know, uh, validate that service is ready to go, uh, you know, do shadow traffic, uh, you know, put, uh, you know, put things onto a proxy, validate this traffic. It runs all of the checks and hooks into our monitoring system and this is all fully automated. And if at any point there is an invariant that doesn't quite match up, it immediately pings an engineer. Now, Part of the tooling is also built to, to give delight to the teams uh, for which uh, we're migrating their, their services. So this is a very critical part of the automation, which is notifying service owners. We can go to all of these individual teams and craft a message that says, hey, we are migrating your service. Please acknowledge this message. Uh, but you know, uh, we're, we're in 2023. Uh, we have automation at our disposal. Uh, so why not automate uh, all of that? Uh, this is really, really mega helpful because uh, for teams, uh, you know, especially if you are on call for a particular piece of software uh, and something has changed beneath your, beneath your feet, uh, you want to be notified just in case that there is a correlation between something going bad, a software change going bad, and this migration happening. Uh, so uh, we actually got to a state where engineers were excited when they got this notification. They sort of welcomed it with a wave emoji, uh, which was very, very nice to see. Um, yeah, like, uh, you know, that, that came in uh, really, really handy. Now, um, prioritizing how we do these migrations, uh, you know, na naturally, like, like most migrations, we started them on low critical services first, uh, you know, services that run behind the scenes, uh, services that are not core to, to banking needs. And as we move further down the tiers, we get into the tier one and tier zero services, things that are critical for providing a core banking experience for our customers and for services uh, that are running on our platform, like authentication and our ledger. 
So typically, we'll start with migrating these tier three and tier two services first, which allow us to, to understand the edge cases. Uh, I'd be lying if I said, uh, you know, these migrations go smoothly first time around in production. You know, production is a very different beast to what you have in any sort of testing environment, and things inevitably go wrong. Uh, fortunately, in these like tier three and tier two services, we have a lot of systems that are running at really, really high throughput, even higher throughput, uh, or like, you know, with larger scaling uh, 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 scaling uh, areas uh, compared to our tier zero and tier one services. Uh, so we're able to really test the reins on these particular pieces of migrations. And when we become confident on those on those systems, we can move on to our critical, uh, critical services as well. Um, and sometimes uh, these migration processes can take weeks or months, but by virtue of automating them, uh, you know, we have uh, you know, engineers spending their time on on other things. Now, you know, you can you can do it whatever way that you want. Uh, you can have a percentage based rollout or do A/B testing. One of the things I recommend the most is make it very very easy to determine uh, whether a service is in some process of migration. Or if you have, for example, a system rolling out to a percentage of your users, make it extremely easy to figure out whether a user is part of an experiment. Uh, you know, often I see like you know a massive dance that needs to be done in your computer hash algorithms in your head and, you know, uh, trying to calculate Murmur 3 in your head. I've seen all sorts of wacky things go wrong and, you know, it, it's an absolute disaster uh, because you can't see explicitly. You can't correlate, for example, at three in the morning if something has gone horribly wrong, uh, if a user is affected by an experiment or, or, or your or existing code. Now, as I mentioned, uh, you know, things don't go wrong first time round. Uh, production is really where the fun bugs surface. And... You know, we do these things in a tiered manner uh, to, to minimize impact, uh, especially to, to not have a significant amount of customer facing impact, but we do have incidents uh, whenever we run these migrations. Um, and this is a perfect way as leaders, as principal and staff engineers to show our advocacy and support, um, especially when you have someone earlier on in their career uh, sort of managing uh, the steps of these migrations. Um, you know, they're gonna be mortified, uh, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. And something like this can really impact their confidence. So offering words of encouragement uh, and like, you know, being able to sort of continue forwards is really, really helpful. Um, I mentioned earlier about, you know, uh, knowing whether you are in a state of migration. Uh, that is, uh, so if you can encode that as a very simple check, uh, that is going to be mega, mega helpful. Um, if an incident is attributed to the migration itself, your response is going to be super, super critical. Uh, you know, incidents like these are trust building exercises. Uh, and it, there is a very easy way to uh, undermine trust, to sort of break trust with your fellow engineers if your response is not uh, appropriate for the, for the level of incident. Don't accept deviant behavior is one of our architectural uh, uh, principles and it's something that I think applies uh, extremely to uh, when you're running migrations. Don't accept deviant behavior. If you are, uh, you know, going into these incidents and you are, you know, giving the uh, a very detailed root cause analysis uh, and you know, explaining to engineers why things have gone wrong, you, you will build an outsized amount of trust and that will actually encourage other engineers to get, get involved, give support and also encourage you to move forwards. You know, often I find these migrations, uh, you know, someone's like, comes on, it's like, I don't want this to run anymore. I don't want you changing my software uh, and uh, to avoid that, build trust. Uh, and on a more positive note, uh, you know, when these migrations are done and when you reach key milestones, you've got to celebrate the wins. Make stickers, you know, shout about, uh, you know, a, a good job that everyone has done. Uh, you know, these can take weeks, years, uh, weeks, months, years to get over the line. Uh, and it's really important that we celebrate our, our key, key milestones. Uh, you know, retrospect on what things have gone right and retrospect on what things have gone wrong and what you can do better. Uh, I think I have massive run over time, so I'm really sorry. Uh, but hopefully, if you do use this as a blueprint for navigating complex migrations, I'd love to hear about what has worked for you and what hasn't. Thank you very much.